Bethsaida, he had been paralyzed, or shall we say, could not walk for how long? 38 years. Now, we don't know that he was at the pool of Bethsaida for 38 years, but he was there so regularly that he was just there all the time. Got to the point where he expected nothing to change. You ever get that way in your life? Everything, you know, you're hoping for change, you're hoping for change, you're broken down to Los Manos, and you're thinking, well, maybe my truck will be finished tomorrow. Uh, and like Dave, you know, Dave's car has been in the shop, I think it was in the shop for like two weeks, he called to check on it, they hadn't even started on it yet. You ever feel like that's where you are in your life? Uh, and just know that sometimes you may think that things are falling apart when they're falling in place. So let's not forget that. So here is the story going to continue out of the Bible. I hope you have a Bible, and you can turn with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5 is where we're going to be. A little bit of a recap. Uh, we've been studying lesson 33, A, B, C, D, and E. Uh, you see how it all breaks down in this chapter in verses uh, 1 through 47. Uh, and so today we're going to talk about Jesus and the Father. Jesus and the Father. Recap, Jesus heals the man at the pool of Bethsaida. Just so it happened that it happened on the Sabbath day. Now let me just ask, what day is the Sabbath day? Saturday. It is Saturday. It is still Saturday. Uh, even though, you know, for us we worship on Sunday, the Sabbath is the last day of the week. Uh, and remember in Israel, the last day of the week actually began at 6 o'clock on Friday night and goes till 6 o'clock on Saturday night. And so they're way out of Sabbath and well into their work week. Uh, the Jews called the man a sinner because he was working. Uh, you could do a certain amount of walk. You could do a certain amount of work. But if you exerted a little too much exercise, it was considered work. And according to their Mishnah, their version of the law, it was not only a sin, but so blasphemous. It was awful if you could ever get right with God again. Jesus healed this man, uh, and he had no idea, had no clue that this was Jesus, who Jesus was, what Jesus could do, uh, just nothing. So Jesus, later in the day, finds the man in the temple area. Not in the temple, but in the temple area. Anybody remember the name of that gate that would go from the temple area to the pool of Bethsaida? Yes, the sheep gate. I know that's what you were thinking. And so you could go right through the sheep gate there. And the man finds out that it was Jesus. Jesus looks at him and he says, stop sinning, meaning the sins that you are currently doing. And, and many people believe that the sins that they were, he was currently doing was the very sin that caused him to be crippled in the first place. Anybody ever do something and you go, that was dumb. And it was only by the grace of God, or some people say by luck. But technically, it's still the grace of God that we weren't injured. I, I mean, when uh, there were times on my motorcycle, I would go well over 100 miles an hour just for fun. Jerry, did you ever do that on your Harley? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, so, see, <laughs> so if you want to emulate us, there, there's two fine examples of people to emulate, Jerry and me. It was only by the grace of God that, that I, I'm still alive uh, or, you know, can still walk. Uh, and things like that. And, and so Jesus says, stop what you're doing, currently doing, or something worse will happen. And the biggest something worse is stop not knowing Jesus as Savior because the worst thing that could ever happen is to go to a crisis eternity. That's right. And so the man rushes straight away to the Jews and says, it was Jesus. Don't blame me. Uh, blame Jesus. And we talked last week, we've been doing that all our lives. Adam and Eve in the garden, God shows up and says, uh, who told you you were naked? He says, it was that woman you gave me. So who did Adam blame his sin on? God. And so does this man. Jesus is accused then of working on the Sabbath day, so he can't possibly be a, a holy man. He can't possibly be a Rabboni. And so although they don't formally accuse him, Jesus comes up with a formal answer. He says, my father is working until now, and I must be working and as soon as he said that, he was claiming to be one with God. Now, to these strictly monotheistic people who could not understand, nor did they want to understand, that God could exist in multiple personalities, they thought that was the utmost of what? Blasphemy. And so that's where we pick it up. So let's go ahead and begin reading here in verse number 18. Uh, it's all going to be up on the screen, but I hope you brought your Bible with you. And this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. See, they were seeking to kill him when he did these things on the Sabbath. But as soon as he said he and God were 
the same, all the more to kill him, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. So Jesus said to them, now notice, they are thinking this amongst themselves, Jesus just shouts it out. Aren't you glad that God knows exactly what we're thinking all the time? So Jesus says to them, truly, truly. Now, how many of us know that in the original language, these two words, truly, truly, are amen, amen. Be pronounced in their day, it would be amen, amen. And so what does it mean? This is, this is good stuff. This is, listen up. I don't know how many times my mom would grab me by my cheeks. And she would look at me and she'd go, look at me when I'm talking to you. <laughs> Anybody ever do that? Have that happen to you? Okay. And so this is Jesus theologically and psychologically grabbing their cheeks and saying what? What I am about to say is so important. Listen, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own accord. That does not mean he drove a Honda. I know that that's what a lot of people think. What kind of God, car did Jesus drive? Even though he had one accord, it was not a Honda. Okay, let's keep going. Then. I can do nothing on my own accord, but only what I see the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he wills. For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Now listen up. Truly, truly, I say to you. Notice it starts with a truly, truly, and this paragraph ends with a truly, truly. Truly, truly, I say to you, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And he does not come into judgment, but is passed from death to life. Let's pray together. Father, as we now go back and go from reading this passage to allowing this passage to make a difference in our psyche, in our soul. Lord, uh, speak to each and every one of us. Although what you say may be different, it can all be derived from this very passage. So Lord, do what only you can do, and that is to speak corporately, individually, so that individually we might be a better corporate. And I would pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, the next few slides are going to be this exact same slide, just with different things underlined. And, and so all we're going to do is just take some of these phrases and break them down. Now, I know sometimes we come in and we pick up one of those sermon guides and it says the then, the now, and then at the bottom it says something like what? A AFT. And what does that AFT stand for? Application for today. And this is what we're going to do. In about 12 minutes, I'm going to ask you, what can you apply from today's teaching? If everybody sits there and doesn't say a word then I'll know that it was so deep that you can't even put it into words. Okay, here we go. The first thing we want to say is, truly, truly, I say to you. Now, do you think this truly, truly, I say to you was just for this crowd at that moment? Or do you think that this transcends all time and space? And so God wants to say to us today, truly, truly, I want to speak to you. Truly, I want to speak to you. And I want you to notice it's coming straight out of his word. We don't need somebody coming up, and as we heard from several other people, say, well, this is a good book, or this is a good thought, or I saw this on Oprah. The only thing that will make a big difference in your life and make your life make a big difference in your soul and your family is we, if we truly, truly listen to God's word over and over and over again. I heard one person one time say, have you ever read your Bible? He says, yeah, I read it once. As if, uh, like any other Moby Dick or any other great... Biblical, or, or the non-biblical linguistical masterpieces, you read it once and you're okay. But let me just ask you this. Has anybody ever read the same book more than once? I've seen children read great big Harry Potter books so big they can barely hold them up in their hand over and over again. I've seen adults watch the same movie over and over again to the point where they can actually say the lines in sequence and time with the person on the movie screen. 
We had a, a student intern that was uh, going to Southwestern Seminary, stayed with us, and the Wizard of Oz came on. And you would have thought that a second coming had happened. <laughs> and he sat there and watched and said every line, sang every song, word for word, perfect for the entire movie of Wizard of Oz. And he could say, all right, it's about to go to black and white. It's not going to change the color. It's not going to do this. And if you look under here, you can see this over there. I mean, he had literally studied the Wizard of Oz. And some of us who call ourselves Christians have, haven't even read through the whole Bible, much less studied it. Truly, truly, God wants to talk to us today. Truly, truly, I say to you. Now remember, this is not Ray talking. This is Jesus saying, and I'm just reading his words. Truly, truly, and how many of you have got a red letter version of the Bible? Now how many of us know what that means? That those are, now don't say the words of Jesus. Those are the direct quotes. Because isn't verse 18 the words of Jesus? They all are the words of Jesus. But the red letters are the direct quotes. And so Jesus, here we are directly quoting Jesus. Truly, truly, I want to say to you that the Son can do nothing on his own accord. Now what does that mean? That means the Son is so connected to the Father. And that's what we want to talk about is Jesus, the second person, and God, the first person, or the Heavenly Father. In a, verses, a couple of verses ago, when he was explaining to the scribes and the Pharisees and the Jews, he said, my father is working until now. He did not say our father. He did not include them in the equation. You see, if we're going to pray that prayer, our father who art in heaven, in order for us to pray that corporately, everybody in the room would have to be what? A believer. A God-defined believer. Not a person. There's a lot of people that I see on television who say that they're a believer, and then you ask them, well, what does that mean? And they give you some definition that is so extra biblical that you have no idea how they ever came up with that. But it is not God's definition of you. If it's not God's view of being saved, guess what? Not saved. Not saved. The son can do nothing on his own accord. That means Jesus has so connected to God. Now, he is the second person of the Trinity, but think about this. If I had the power, how many of us would try to usurp that power and become number one? I don't know how many of us have ever been in a band or an orchestra, but they say the hardest, the hardest instrument to play is second instrument. You know what that means? That the first instrument, the first uh, trumpet trum player, or the first clarinet player, they're leading the whole section. And, and the hardest thing to do is to sit next to the person who's leading without bleeding over and trying to usurp that chair. And isn't that what we just heard from NCT? Is how many of us have bled over to our own preoccupation with self, and, and we want Jesus in our lives, we just don't want him sitting on the throne. We just want him in our lives, but I'll, I'll, I'll ultimately be the choice maker. You see, Jesus is saying, if we really want to be in one accord with God, we have got to do nothing on our own volition. Now let me just say, we are not Jesus. But do you, do you even have a desire so that you could literally look at people and people could look at your lives and say, the way that person lives, you could see that he has a desire to act in accordance with God all the time. All the time. So truly he says, I can do nothing on my own. The next phrase is this, but I can only see what I can only do what I see God doing. In other words, when Jesus was on earth, he was imitating what he had seen the Father do in heaven. And what did he ask for us? He asked for us to imitate him in his absence. So if you take a look at the way in which the world unfolds for us, it is Jesus watched the Father and then came and showed us who the Father is and how the Father operates. And then Jesus taught his disciples, who taught his disciples, who taught his disciples, until it breaks down to us that we can only do, we should only want to do, what we know that Jesus saw God doing in the first place. He goes on to say this, for whatever the Father does, that's what I want to do. That's what I do. I only do what the Father does. I had a person ask me this week, what are we going to do in heaven? Now, how many of us are thinking about heaven for what we're going to do there rather than who we're going to meet there? You know, 
so many of us are thinking about this time continuum. What are we going to do all day? Are we just going to sit around and sing? Are we just going to sit around and pray as if those would be boring? But let me just remind us of this. In heaven, what is time? What is time? It's forever what? Right now. It's forever right now. In heaven, when did God create the world? Right now. In heaven, when did they walk across the, the wilderness and the wilderness wanderings before the promised land? Right now. Uh, in, in heaven, when was the nativity? Right now. In heaven, when was the crucifixion? Right now. Hear this. In heaven, when is the culmination of the ages? So when we get to heaven, we will forget about what are we going to do because... Do means time. It takes time to do something. In heaven, we just do. It would be, uh, Jerry will play golf and turn in a score of 18. God. It will be putt-putt golf, but it will be golf. For whatever the Father does, the Son does. But in order for me to do the things of God, I need to what? I, know, I need to know what God does. I, I need to have my eye on the Savior. That's why the, the writer of Hebrews could say, if we fix our eyes on Jesus, everything else will go strangely dim. Everything else will cease to uh, um, you know, drive us and encourage us to be a part of that. Jesus goes on then and says, the Father loves the Son. Did you know that the Father's love for the Son was because of the, love son, the Son's love for the Father? And did you know that God promises us this, that if we are truly listening to him, and so if we are walking in accord with him, if we are watching him and learning of him, he's going to love us too. Now that does not mean God's love is conditional. God's love is unconditional, but he loves seeing us love him. How many of you have ever had a child that acted up and needed discipline? But what did the writer of, of Proverbs say? God does not discipline those he doesn't love. God disciplines those he what? I don't know how many times my dad said to me, you know, I'm only doing this because I love you. And I said, well, then don't love me so much. <laughs> you ever feel that way? God disciplines us. Now, hear this word here for discipline does not mean scold. It means make better. Makes better. Uh, and so when I am disciplined, I am being remolded into a better version of me. It is not just, you know, uh, iOS 1.5 and iOS 1.5.5 and iOS 1.5.15.7, but it's similar. It, and now, unfortunately, we know that every time they come out with an update for your computer, your computer quits working for a while. But every time Jesus updates your soul, it works better than ever. He goes on to say this, and he shows him all that he himself is doing. Here, as, as we listen to God, study God's word, emulate Jesus who is emulating the Father, the Father's love comes upon us, and then he shows us even more of himself. If you have a limited understanding of God, chances are you haven't done the above ones. This is a pretty amazing, you could read this, what, in a minute? We could spend the rest of my history here. And I'm planning on being your pastor for about 35 more years. We could spend 35 more years and study nothing but this paragraph for the next 35 years and never get to the bottom. He will show us more and more of himself. And then he says about Jesus, and greater works than these, you will see. In other words, greater works than what? Working on the Sabbath, raising a man uh, uh, who can walk. He, the ultimate greatest work in his human event is going to happen just a week before he dies. And then he's going to cause Lazarus out of the tomb. But in between this time, the, the time of the raising of the man in the uh, synagogue area, uh, the temple area during the time of Sabbath, all the way up until the time when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, the works are going to get greater and greater and more amazing. In fact, one woman is just going to say to herself, I don't even need him to acknowledge me. If I just touch him, my issue of blood will cease. That's even greater works. But you know, the greatest work will not be at the raising of Lazarus, but the God raising of Jesus. Three days. And then he says, and the reason I am doing these is so that I'm showing you so that you may marvel. Now, this word here for marvel means to go beyond your comprehension 
understand, but to drive you to know him better. It was sort of like Moses, when Moses saw the bush that was burning but not being consumed, and he could have said, now how many of us said, well, that's amazing, just walk away. How many of us have taken a look at something and go, oh, do tell, and pay it no attention. But when something truly marvels us, it draws us in. It, caps, it captures us. It, it forces us to come in. And so when Moses saw the bush that was on fire and was not being consumed, he could not do anything but go forward. And when we see God for who God really is and what God really can do, what he has done on the cross and what he has done in the life of people, even greater works than these, it will draw us in. What is the result of drawing us in? We will have more love for the Father. The Father will show us more of himself. The Father shows us more of himself so that we can be more of an imitator of Jesus who is imitating God because truly, truly I say to you, the Son can't do nothing on his own accord. Let's continue. For the Father is the only one that can raise the dead. Jesus was raised from the dead, not because he all of a sudden, he's laying there dead, saying, I think I'll come back alive. Now, let's not forget that when Jesus died, Jesus never died, just his body did. Do we get that? And every person who has ever died, their body stopped working. But their soul and essence continued and still does. And the, the Bible tells us we are going to be put back together again if we die here on this planet. And eventually one day we will be put back together again with a glorified body. My body hurts every single inch. You know, I used to laugh at people that used to tell me that they hurt all the time. All those old people. Now I am one. The other night I dislocated my back sleeping. I mean, I can hurt myself just laying down. But a day is going to come when Jesus is going to come back again. And the Father is going to raise the dead. The dead in Christ. Not only to a new time zone, but a new body. The Father raises the dead. Notice this. The Son gives life to whom he will. Now notice, he doesn't say raise the dead. But there, there's only one way to have eternal life, and that is through the Son. And it is because of the will of the Son. The Father raises the dead. Jesus brings salvation. Verse number 22. For the Father judges no one. Uh, what does that mean? That means he leaves the net result to our eternal future based on your relationship with Jesus Christ. And notice he goes right on to say that. For he has given all judgment to the Son. So the judgment of whether or not you are right with God based on whether or not you are right with Jesus is given completely to Jesus. There is no other way. It's not all of a sudden like God's going to say, you know what? Maybe there's a plan B. You know, if you believe in Jesus, but let's say you didn't believe in Jesus, but you drove a, a Chevy or whatever idol you put in there, even if you call her co-redemptress, there is only one that all judgment will be going through to meet the, the favor of God to eternity. And it's the judgment of Jesus from the cross. So that, notice this, so that all may honor the Son. You see, Jesus is talking to a group that say they love the Father, but they hate Him. And I have talked to people who said, I am right with God, but I don't want anything to do with this Jesus. But hear me, I've also talked to other people who have said what? I really love Jesus, but you can keep that God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament is who? Jesus! And they're wanting to be able to say that they can be right with the one and only, the monotheistic God who exists in three persons without wanting to have anything to do with Jesus. But I've also heard people say this, I'm right with God because I I'm really filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm so filled with the Holy Spirit, I can do this and I can do this and I can do this and I can do this. Let me tell you this, Jesus would say, you can do nothing without the Father. And the Son can't do anything without the Father. And so don't think that just because you think you have the Holy Spirit and because you can do some things that are pretty amazing, that the job of the Holy Spirit is not to amaze us, but hear me, to seal us, convict us, and then to teach us all things. Now, why would he want to teach us and remind us all things like it says in John 14, 15, and 16? So that what? So that we may know the Father better. So that we may live the imitation life of the Father through the Son better. 
so that the Father will see us and say, well done, good and faithful servant. And, and then show us more and more and more. That all may honor the Son just like they honor the Father. You can't honor one or. This is not smorgasbord theology. You've got you to take in the entire course. He goes on to say this, that whoever does not honor the Son doesn't honor God either. Doesn't honor God either. He culminates by saying again, truly, truly. If I didn't get your attention in the beginning, let me get your attention now. Now, how many of us uh, at the end of the sermon have heard me say something like this? If you didn't get anything else, catch this. I, I hope you caught something along the way. But if you didn't get anything else from this paragraph of Jesus, catch this. He says, truly, whoever hears my word. Now, this word here, akuete, literally means the ability to hear it, take it into your mind, and then have a desire to not only say, I heard it, but to say what? I'll do it. I will, I will have immediate, immediate effect on me so I can have application for today from this passage. Whoever hears my word, if we're here today and you heard from God, you should leave here today with more application from God's word. Whoever hears my word, notice, and then believes in him who sent me. For God so loved the world that he did what? He sent his one and only son. For God, it was all instigated by God. It was all imitated by Jesus. It all culminates on the cross. And it, because Jesus will save whom he wills. Right here in this passage. If you hear my word and believe in him who sent me, you, you can't just believe in Jesus. You've got to believe in the whole package. Salvation is all of this. You have eternal life. If you don't believe even one part of it, you're guilty of not believing all of it. Does that make sense? We've got to believe it all. But we don't believe. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment. So what do we hear from our Heavenly Father? Words of affirmation. Does he still discipline us to make us better? He does not. And, and, and don't get the wrong idea. It doesn't mean you can't say she does not. But you know, we're just talking about that humanity. Who, who hears men and women, boys and girls. He who does not come will not come into judgment, but passes from what? Death unto life. Now hear me, this does not necessarily mean go to heaven when you die. It means to stop living a dead life and start living a vital life. Why are you still here? Okay, I'm going to put a couple pictures up. As I do, anybody say, I, this, this, I learned something from this passage you want to share it with us right now. Any application, Mark? Attitudes, behaviors are learned, so we can either learn from God or we can learn from the world. Amen. Anybody else? Margaret? We should only want to do what we see the Father doing, so we need to uh, keep our eye on the Savior. And the best way to do that is how? Yeah, okay. Anybody else? These words weren't just addressed to the crowd. enforcement officer, do you ever go up to somebody's window and you're trying to help them, but they, you could tell that they could care less what you're saying? Does that ever happen? Probably doesn't happen. Probably doesn't happen. Okay. Yeah, probably doesn't happen. No. Could you imagine God pulling us over in life because he wants to give us not a ticket, but the ticket to rightness? And we're so distracted and, and, and I, don't want, I don't have time for God to pull me over. I like this picture because we usually think of going from life to death. But Jesus says in order to be right for him, we need to go from death to life. We need to walk away from the cemetery of living and walk into the living of life. Not just eternally. This is not just a picture of where are we going to go when we die. 
But how many times have you heard me say when I baptize someone that we are buried together with Christ and we what? We stay in the water and drown. Or we rise to walk with Him in newness of life. We need to have a new life experience that the more we know God. Now this is what they've been telling me in therapy. That every time I have a little bit of gain in my ability to use my knee, it will come with a little bit of pain. And I said, well, then I'm good now. This is good enough. My knee is good enough then. And how many of us have gotten to our Christian life where we're limping with Christ when God has created us to thrive? Take a look at this one. Any other thoughts before we quit for today? Anybody? Now let me just say this, that if you go back and read this paragraph again today, and you, and you want to, and you truly want to make my day a great day, send me an email telling you what God is. Because God says, God's got you right now. Truly, truly, I want to show to you. Truly, truly, I love you so much. I want your undivided attention. And if God shows you something as you continue to continue, I know a lot of us don't like to talk out loud. But if God shows you something, send it to me so that I can praise the Father. Because the Son cannot do anything on His own accord. Because whatever He sees the Father doing, that's what He does. And as He does this, the Father loves to watch the Son doing that. And then the Father shows us more and more. So that as He shows us more and more, we are better able to know Him better, to serve Him more eloquently and rightly. So that people will marvel at the greater things He is doing in our lives. Because what has God promised? God has promised that this, the Father is not going to judge anyone, but has given all that judgment to the cross of Christ in Christ. And so all of the wrath of God was placed upon Jesus. And as Pastor Darrell prayed a few minutes ago, that when he disciplines, it is out of his grace, not out of his wrath. Jesus took the wrath. So that whoever believes in him and he who sent him has eternal life and has passed not just someday into heaven, but it's past all the garbage that this world has so that we can stop living in the dump and start living like a child of the King. Let's pray together. Father, what a great passage of Scripture. And Lord, I would just pray that each and every one of us and then corporately all of us will be ever desiring to ever learning. And, and as Mark said, Father, that uh, behavior is learned. Help us to behave like Jesus. Because we love you. Because we want to serve you until we see you face to face. In Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. <laughs>